Hare Krishna Prabhu, please accept our humble obeisances. All glories to Shri Prabhupada. We welcome devotees to our morning Bhagavatam class. This morning, the class will be given by His Holiness Chandramala Swami, all the way from Slo Slovenia. Thank you so much, Maharaj. Please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Shri Prabhupada. All glories to you, Maharaj. We have a few devotees rolling in. Um, you can start if you want. I'm, they're just coming in one by one. Okay. Um, let's see here. Okay. Um, I'll begin with the invocation and then read the Sanskrit in a translation. Maybe you could find someone who is very erudite and who knows how to read clearly and uh, <clears throat> where everyone can understand. No problem, mm -hmm. Lars. Okay. <clears throat> Let's see. Kumam Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prastaya Bhutale Shri Makti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Tinamre Namaste Saraswati Deve Gaurani Pachari Nene Vishesha Sindhya Vahari Pasvyatya Deve Sitarane Panchakopa through Bischa, Kripa Sindhu, the Avaja, the Titanam, Pavane, Blo, Vaishnava, Blo, Namaho, Namaha. Jaisi Krishna, Chaitanya, Prabhu, Nityananda, Sri Advaita, Gadadhar, Shiva, Sri Gauri, Bhakta Vindam, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Om Gyan, Timirandasya, Ganadana, Savakaya. So today's verse is from the Srimad Bhagavatam, first canto, third chapter, verse number 22. These are the, in, the uh, incarnations of the Lord in his various manifestations. And so this verse is verse number 22. Okay. So I'll begin. Nara Deva Tvam Apanam Surakarya Chikir Saya Samudra Nigra Adini Chakravaryanyata Param. In the 18th incarnation, let's see, the Lord appeared as King Rama in order to perform some pleasing work for the demigods. He exhibited superhuman powers by controlling the Indian Ocean and then killing the atheist King Ravana, who was on the other side of the sea. So let's see who can uh, continue. I can read it for you, Maharaj. For report by His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Shri Prabhupada Ki Jai. The personality of Godhead, Sri Rama, assumed the form of a human being and a earth. For the purpose of doing some pleasing work for the demigods or the administrative personalities to maintain the order of the universe. Sometimes great demons and atheists like Ravan and Hiranyakasipu and many others become very famous due to advancing material civilization by the help of material science and other activities with the spirit of challenging the established order of the Lord. For example, the attempt to fly to other planets by material means as a challenge to the established order. The conditions of each and every planet are different and different classes of human beings are accommodated there for particular purposes mentioned in the codes of the Lord. But puffed up by tiny success in material advancement, sometimes the godless materialist challenged the existence of God. Ravan was one of them, and he wanted to, to deport ordinary men to the planet of Indra, heaven, by material means without consideration of the necessary qualifications. He wanted, a, he wanted a staircase to be built up directly, reaching the heavenly planet so that people might not be required to undergo the routine of pious work necessary to enter that planet. He also wanted to perform other acts against the established rule of the Lord. He even challenged the authority of Sri Ram, the personality of Godhead, and kidnapped his wife, Sita. Of course, Lord Ram came to chastise this, this atheist, answering the prayer and desire of the demigods. 
He therefore took up the challenge of Ravan and the complete activity is the subject matter of Ramayan. Because Lord Ramachandra was the personality of Godhead, he exhibited superhuman activities which no human being, including the materially advanced Ravan, could perform. Lord Ramachandra prepared a royal road on the Indian Ocean with stones that floated on the water. The modern scientists have done research in the area of weightlessness, but it is not possible to bring in weightlessness anywhere and everywhere. But because weightlessness is the creation of the Lord by which he can make the gigantic planets fly and float in the air, he made the stones even within this earth to be weightless and prepared a stone bridge on the sea without any supporting flood. That is the display of the power of God. Okay. <clears throat> if you'll just give me less than 30 seconds, I'll return. <laughs> Well, there's one nice verse that's mentioned in the Sri Brahma Samhita, Bhamari Murti Shukalani Amena Tishtam Nana Vatara Akaro Bhuvane Sukhenshu Krishna Swayam Samabhavat Paramam Paman Yo Govindamari Purusham Tamaham Bhajami so the Lord manifests his form as Sri Ram. He is one of the, he's listed as one of the Leela incarnations, but amongst the Narayan manifestations of the Lord, he is considered to be the topmost. As the planets within the, within the spiritual world are, are higher and lower according to position, the highest planet in the, the, in the spiritual world, outside of Goloka Vrindavan, that means within the Vaikuntha realm, is Sri Ram's planet. It's called Ayodhya Dham. <clears throat> and that Dham has manifested in this material world in a place in India called Ayodhya Dham. So this particular verse is emphasizing some of his activities. And Prabhupada wants to make a clear distinction between uh, natural God power and the artificial attempt to imitate God by trying to do some of the same things in a s smaller way. <laughs> and of course, uh, the idea that Prabhupada is presenting here is it interferes with and or they try to interfere with the natural arrangement of the Lord. As he uses the example going to other planets Everything is arranged nicely, and on each planet there are living beings accordingly. And so one cannot simply make a me mechanical device and expect to ride up to another planet. And this is all some kind of fairy tale. Uh, it never really happened. They talk about it. They, of course, they shot up these different space things, but it never reached anywhere. <laughs> so, uh, and they spent, spent million, not millions, but billions. I think the, the whole space program cost $5 billion in its inception. So, um, yeah, so we see how the materialists, rather than appreciate the arrangements of God and try to glorify God for his arrangements and learn from the Lord and through his representatives what is the nature of those arrangements and how to benefit from them. They want to challenge God and become little gods by trying to do something in a, in a very grand way 
in, according to material uh, calculations. <clears throat> now this is foolishness. We also hear how when the Lord wanted to cross the Indian Ocean, it was 800 miles across. So uh, they wanted to build, the Lord decided to build a bridge. <laughs> So that, that bridge that they made was simply the, his army, which included monkey soldiers, who were gathering rocks from all around and actually throwing them into the ocean. And because of the Lord's presence, <clears throat> the rocks were floating and they actually constructed a bridge 800 miles long and 80 miles wide. It was a huge bridge that, that brought across millions and millions of monkey soldiers. Now, the interesting thing about this is that, um, what was I going to say? That even today, in fact, I just read something just recently. Some people say, well, this is all mythology, some nice story that people get entertained with and they have spiritual messages in the story, but the story is just a way to contain the spiritual messages, but there's no truth to it. But just recently, and of course, many years ago, twice, they have discovered underneath the ocean between the area of Ceylon, which was formerly known as Lanka, and the, the shore of India, they found actually, they found these big gigantic rocks underneath the sea. And by their own calculations, they'd be bewildered by how these rocks could be there and how they could stay for so long. They can't understand it. So they're actually shown by their own observation that that bridge actually did happen. Of course, we all know it. We don't have to become convinced. But if there's anyone out there who has to be convinced, even the science have discovered remnants of this bridge. And they have given it a name. They call it the Adams Bridge, <laughs> which is a series of rocks that line themselves. But what bewilders them is the rocks itself, is how they were, a how they were able to maintain themselves after being under the ocean for so long without becoming the deteriorated. <laughs> That's because when the monkeys were throwing the rocks, Ram was actually putting inscriptions on his own name on the rocks. So it's, uh, so these are, for the Lord, this is routine. Uh, when we look around the world, we can see that there are miracles happening at every moment. You take a little tiny seed, you plant it in the ground, and with the proper arrangements, you have a gigantic tree. So the Lord can put a, put a huge tree in, into a little tiny seed. And simply by adding some proper sunlight and water, you get something, uh, well, you might say miraculous. Miracles, we might say something that is outside of the ordinary or happening every day, just like Prabhupada also points out, how is it these big gigantic planets can float in air? Um, it's like an ocean of air and these planets are like islands in the ocean of air. And they also use this thing called gravity. So they say some, there's some force called gravity. <laughs> so they give it some kind of material name. But actually, it's just the potency of the Supreme Personality of God, and no matter what you want to label it. So, therefore, God is great. And when he came, he performed many wonderful activities in order to uh, complete his pastimes. And this particular pastime is one of the favorites of all the Vaishnavas all around the world. In fact, Ram Lila in the Ramayan is the most widely read scripture anywhere in the world, widely read religious scripture, because it is, in, it's found in not only in, in Vedic uh, cultural text in India, but throughout all of Asia <clears throat> in, under different names in different languages. 
so it's quite popular all around the Asian world. And then, of course, now it's floating everywhere in the Western world by the arrangement of Srila Prabhupada. <laughs> So this, this pastime is quite amazing. There's so much to the pastime. How the Lord exhibited the qualities of the perfect king, the perfect husband. <clears throat> he was, uh, he acted inside or within the rules and regulations of Dharma. Whereas if you make a comparison, you find that Krishna didn't follow Dharma. He did whatever he wanted, whenever he wanted. <laughs> That's Krishna. He can do that because he is the author of Dharma. So if he decides to break Dharma, that is also Dharma. You can't complain the creator of Dharma for breaking Dharma because he's the person who is the author of Dharma. So therefore he knows Dharma. But <clears throat> Ram is more what we say in line with all of the rules and regulations of morality, civility, and kingly rule. And therefore, people talk about Ram in the sense that we want an ideal society. <clears throat> and we call it Raj Ram, or Ram Raj, Ram Raj, the rule of Ram, where the king, the leader, <clears throat> is exemplary in his behavior towards others. And he's powerful enough to maintain the citizens and move them along to the goal of life, which is God realization. Nowadays, Ram Raj is very much needed because as we look around the world, we, we don't see any leader who actually has the qualification of becoming a leader. As Prabhupada would so rightly point out, the leaders of the day are mostly interested in their own sense gratification, power, position, aggrandizement. If they do something to benefit the people, it's incidental. But it's mostly about you know, party politics, power, uh, position, um, gaining material, uh, what we say, enmities like that. And so, therefore, the world is at a very, what we say, precarious situation. There's wars brewing in many places in the world, and then there's always the danger of a major war. Uh, the leaders don't know anything about how to lead. They don't have the qualifications to lead. Therefore, if they, we study uh, Ram's lead, we find out what is the ideal king. Uh, the ideal king is like the father <clears throat> who takes care of the citizens like a like a father takes care of his children within the family that is the actual relationship between the leader of society and the uh, citizens the citizens are also called progeny they are the progeny of the ruler the ruler in other words they are taken care of by the by the leader and they're expected to reciprocate through doing various types of services and following the principles as, as given in, in the governance of society. But <clears throat> um, the king <clears throat> is the most important because he has to lead based on uh, expertise in material arrangements and also He's dharmic. That's why kings were called Rajarsik. Although Ram was the supreme personality of Godhead, and it was obviously he exhibited his, his prowess as the supreme personality of Godhead in the many, many different incidents, not only in, uh, in uh, crossing the ocean by creating a bridge out of rocks, which was, which was materially impossible, but he also fought with 14,000 soldiers single-handedly and killed every one of them. And so he, uh, he exhibited his godlike potency many times in that particular leela. But yet he followed the principles of a, a good son, very obedient to his father when his father asked him to leave the, the kingdom and go to the forest. 
although his father wasn't inclined to that, but he was forced to that because it is understood that when the Kshatriya gives its word, he must keep his word. If he doesn't, it's worse than death. It's better, it says, it's better for a Kshatriya to give up their life than to break their word. So that's one of the principles of um, Kshatriya Dharma is to be, they follow what they say. We see the opposite here. It is called the campaign speech, which they make all nice words, promise so many nice things. Everyone cheers and then you know, people get excited, and then when they get into the power, they say, well, actually, you know, we, we, we can see that the situation doesn't allow that thing to happen anymore, you know, so they simply give excuses or reasons why they can't do what they promised to do. <laughs> so this is today's, uh, you know, situation. But back to Ram Leela, and we find it's such a absorbing uh, treatise on the loving relationships between the Lord, the citizens, the Lord, his good concert, Sita Devi, and the relationship he had with um, uh, Hanuman and the monkey soldiers. And how he treated, actually he treated Ra, Ravana quite nicely. He gave Ravana so many opportunities to give up his it sounded like the way he was talking that he would even allow Ravana to continue if he simply returned Sita. But we learned from that story that this Ravana is the personification of lusty desires. Now, each of the six uh, different manifestations of Jaya Vijaya when they come to the material world exhibit one of the one of the anarthas in an outstanding way. We understand that each of them have all of the anarthas, but one of the anartha is given to each of them. In Hiraksha, in Hiraksha, it was greed. In Hiranikashipu, it was pride. In, uh, <clears throat> in Kubakarna, it was illusion. In Ravana, it was lust. In Shishupala, it was envy. And Dante Varka exhibited anger. <laughs> so these are the six um, characteristics. Each one of the demons showed this one of the qualities in an outstanding way. So Ravana was so lusty. We can learn from this particular um, life of Ravana a very important thing that lust can never be satisfied. Uh, the more people have to satisfy their lusty desires, the more the fire of lust burns within their mind and heart. Lust is like a fire that, it's, that every time you satisfy it, it's like throwing fuel on the fire. When you throw fuel on the fire, sometimes the fire goes down for a little while. For example, when you're building a wooden fire outside, you may throw a log on there, but you see when the log is placed, the fire goes down because of the weight of the log and the log is still in its normal position. But then after some time when the log catches fire, the fire becomes stronger than it was previously. So this is how lust works. Every time the living entity tries to satisfy their lusty desires, the desire becomes stronger. So therefore austerity, penance, renunciation, and following the principles helps us to overcome this fire-eating demon, as it's caricatured in the Bhagavad Gita. It just burns everything in its past, and it's in its path. As it's mentioned in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna said it is lust and lust only, which comes in contact with the material mode of passion, which is later transformed into wrath, and which is the all-devouring sinful enemy of this world. So <clears throat> when lust becomes unsatisfied, it turns into anger, frustration and anger. And then that anger lashes itself out in different ways. So you see sometimes uh, a country will lust after the properties of another country. And because they unsuccessfully get, can't get it, uh, they, they make that country their enemy. 
and then try to destroy that country. And that is, that's one of the reasons we have wars a lot. You know, just like in this world, there is so much oil in the Middle East and the, the Arabs are, you know, bathing in oil. But the Western countries, they want that oil because they need to keep their, you know, machines going. So they always try to do something either diplomatically or militarily to get that oil in some form or another. And so you see how this lusty desires to enjoy the property of others, sometimes enjoy the, the wife or girlfriend of others, turns into a very uh, ugly situation where everybody or many people suffer. So Ram came to destroy this uh, demon of lust. And therefore, we see within this particular pastime, which is interesting, um, when Ravana and Ram were battling at the end, there was a great battle. It's nicely described in the Ramayan in detail. Um, Ravana had this power that he had 10 heads and then he could manifest, he would some, he would keep one head, but then if he needed, he could manifest 10 different heads. He had this mystic power. And so when Ram was, was fighting with him, he uh, was shooting arrows and cutting off his heads, but the heads would grow back. And so it wasn't getting anywhere. <laughs> so Ram was thinking what to do, but uh, Vibhishan understood the situation. He had now, Vibhishan was the, was the brother of Ravana who had came over to the side of Lord Ram. And he said, you know, he has this unlimited supply of nectar that's in his heart, which keeps him alive. Therefore, you have to shoot an arrow to dry up that nectar, which is situated in his heart. And so the Lord was given an arrow when he was in Chitrakut by one very powerful sage, probably one of the most powerful of all sages, Agastya Muni. Augustine Muni gave the Lord this arrow, which was, as it's described, it was almost like a, uh, what we would say, a nuclear weapon. It was such a powerful arrow. Augustus said, use this only when you need it. So it's very exciting during this very last part of the battle. The Lord put that arrow to his bow, and when he pulled it back, the entire the entire earth started to shake and things were falling everywhere. And it was like, like it was a major cataclysm just when he pulled it back and put it into his bowl. And then he pulled it back as far as he could. And then he shot that arrow and it went tune right into the heart of Ravana, came out the other side went around the earth and came all the way back into the quiver of Ram. That, Ram, that arrow was so powerful. And then, of course, Ravana was finished at that point. And that was the end. So it's interesting to learn that Augusta Muni represents the pure spiritual master. So the spiritual master gives the disciple, the means to conquer over the lusty desires which are in our heart, which are his instructions and guidance, spiritual instructions and practical guidance. By following that, we can destroy these, these ravanas that sit in our heart, which propel the conditioned souls to try to enjoy lusty desires in different forms. And therefore, the, the, the weapon to destroy this demon of lust is available through the mercy of the bona fide spiritual master. So that's a very uh, interesting point because in this whole series of Ramayan, you'll find so many, many, many messages. Practically every moment in every activity that was being performed by the Ram and his, his uh, followers, 
there are powerful, powerful spiritual messages. For instance, when they were building the, the uh, bridge over Lanka, there was one little spider. And some people say spider, some people say um, uh, chipmunk or squirrel who wanted to help. And he was just a little insect animal. And he decided to throw um, little grains of sand into the ocean to help build the bridge. <laughs> when Hanuman, who was lifting these gigantic boulders and throwing them in, saw this little squirrel, he said, excuse me, squirrel, but please move aside. You know, this is man's work. <laughs> so uh, Ram happened to notice Hanuman's act action and he, he rebuked him. He said, no, Hanuman, actually, he is doing as much as you are doing. You are working to your capacity. He is working to his capacity. That is bhakti. Bhakti is not something that you have to gain a lot of strength and a lot of ability. Bhakti is the feature of the heart's uh, natural inclination to love and serve the Lord. Everyone has that. So one who is using that to the capacity that they can, that is considered to be perfect. So that message of the rebuking of Hanuman helped to give us this understanding that God accepts the, the effort, the offering, and not so much what, how the offering comes. In other words, it's not, sometimes people think, well, you know, oh, well, I'm so rich and I'm going to give a, you know, a big donation to the temple and I should have my name put up on the plaque and everyone should know just a wonderful service I've done like that. And then they should all remember me by reading my name. And if you don't give me a plaque, I might not come again, you know, <laughs> so <laughs> I've seen that, you know, it's not like I'm using some exaggeration. I was at one temple and we had one wall full of names of people who were giving donations. And one day what happened was <clears throat> there was a picture of Srila Prabhupada on the same wall, huge picture alongside of all these names, but they needed more wall space. So they took down Srila Prabhupada's picture so they could put more walls, more names on the wall. So one day, um, I was acting like, um, you know, like an agent of the uh, Supreme Personality of Godhead. So one day, I just came and took down the names, the whole plaque, and put Prabhupada's picture back up. So when everyone saw that and realized who did it, they didn't, they, some of them didn't like it, but at the same time, they didn't try to change it again. <laughs> so the point is, you know, it doesn't matter. Krishna accepted, he says, Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, Patram Pushram Falam Toyam Yomi Bhakta Panachyate Taraham Bhakta Uparutam Asnami Vayatat Panaha. So the Lord accepts the loving devotion along with the offering, but the loving devotion is the actual offering itself. So everyone should try to serve in the best possible way, and that is perfection. So we can learn so much from this Ramayan. This is such a powerful, powerful treatise on life. Um, we have so many messages there. How bad association can change a good person into someone, something different. We hear about Kaikeyi, the favorite queen of Ram, who was always a favorite queen, queen of Dasarat, who always was favored by Dasarat, and would come, he would come to see her practically every evening. Um, he had, he had uh, three other wives, no, two other wives, he had three wives. He had Kaikeyi, Sumitra, and Koshalya. 
Koshalya was the mother of um, Ram and Satruga. Uh, Kaikeyi was the mother of Bar, and uh, uh, Sumitra was the mother of Lakshman. Actually, the, the Ramayan actually tells us that he had three principal wives, but um, kings sometimes have more than one wife. It's just the nature of the Kshatri order also. And Prabhupada talks about that. He talks about the principle of polygamy, that it's actually a good thing, because nowadays we don't talk about that because we might get you know, blackballed and criticized. But Prabhupada says, because the woman population is greater than the man population, it's always like that. And then in order to make up the difference, polygamy is also given. But nowadays, as Prabhupada says, man can't even maintain one wife, what to speak about maintaining more than one wife. <laughs> Prabhupada talks about how he was in New York one time and he was talking to this very respectable Indian lady who had a son who was marriageable age. So Prabhupada said, oh, are you going to get your son married? And um, the lady said, yes, if he can support a wife. And Prabhupada was kind of stunned, thinking, wow, so difficult to support a wife nowadays. Hmm. So yeah, this is, this is the feature of Kali Yuga. It's very hard to maintain one wife, what to speak about having, you know, an entourage or a, a series of women as wives. <clears throat> but that was the culture like that. And, and Dasrat actually had 350 other wives, but that's a long story how that happened. I won't get into that right now because I wanted to make the point that Kaikeyi was such a wonderful and sweet and loving and dutiful wife, but still, when she came in contact with her maidservant, Mantara, who tried to poison her when he, she learned that Ram was going to take the throne, Mantara was thinking, I mean, I'm the maidservant of Kaikeyi. If Ram takes the throne, then what happens is that because uh, Kos uh, Kosyalya is the, uh, is the, is the mother of, of Ram, she will be favored as the favored queen. And then my, my uh, master, Kaikeyi, will, will be put in a lesser position, or maybe no position. So being very envious and thinking of losing her own benefits, uh, Mantara started to speak poison and dissuaded Kaikeyi to give up, uh, to use some promises that Dasrath had given her many years ago that she could use two boons and use them anytime she liked. Mantara reminded her what, and then she used them to make Ram go to the forest and to, um, and to, uh, what was the other one? Ram going into the forest for 14 years and to establish, um, yeah, her son, Bar, on the throne. So um, this particular incident is one of the more powerful messages in the Ramayana in the sense that this enviousness is like poison. And to associate with people who have this envious nature is like associating with a snake. Envy is out of all the bad qualities, is the king of all bad qualities because it leads to so many other bad qualities. As Bhaktivinoda Thakur explains in his writings that in, in lust, anger is there. In lust and anger, greed is there. And lust, greed and anger, illusion is there. Lust, greed, anger and illusion, pride is there. And when you have all of them, and then envy, when envy is, envy is there, all the anarthas automatically follow, because envy is the, is the lowest of all bad qualities. <clears throat> and so being very envious 
of uh, Ram, Mandara spoke and convinced because Kaikei didn't want to be convinced at the beginning, but she lent a sympathetic ear and Mantara was expert in speaking in such a way that she was able to get her confidence. And soon as she got her confidence, then she was able to unload her, her, her poison. And hearing that poison, she, Kaikei completely changed. She completely changed. So this is, this is the example of bad association. As Lord Chaitanya told Sanatana yeah, told Sanatan Goswami. Uh, when Sanatan Goswami asked him, what is the first duty of a Vaishnava? The Lord Chaitanya said, Asat, Asat Sangha Tayagya, a Vaishnava Achar. Asat Sangha Tayagya, a Vaishnava Achar. In other words, give up the association of the non-devotees and take to the association of devotees. That is the first business of those who are serious on the path of Krishna consciousness. Because by association, everything comes. Everything is supplied, everything is come to the association of devotees, both externally and what we need to practice Krishna consciousness and internally with the, uh, with the uh, connection with each other because we all have the same goal. We can associate with people in the material world, but we have different goals. And therefore, there's not really much association. People, can, people just take each other's association, but they all have different goals. What is the goal? It's all about me. So therefore, in, this, in the material world, association is not real. It's more or less exploitation based on, the, on being with or associating with certain people to get something that I need or to get something that I want. But devotee association is we all have the same goal. We all want to become Krishna conscious. We all, we all want to go back home, back to Godhead. So that is, the, that is the Sangha, that is the foundation where association actually develops, it thrives. So these are some of the uh, stories uh, in the Ramayana. There are, there are hundreds of stories. I could speak all the way from now until tomorrow on the Ramayana. It's such an amazing scripture. We could go on for hours describing these wonderful pastimes and all of the messages and lessons that come from these pastimes. Therefore, I'll just say, please read the Ramayana. Um, Valmiki's, uh, Valmiki's Ramayana is the most authorized form of Ramayana. In our Krishna conscious society, we have uh, one edition of the Ramayana done by one wonderful Prabhupada disciple named Krishna Dharma from, from uh, London. He's done a wonderful job in presenting the Ramayana so expertly and so interestingly explained. And we have another one, which is in recent, which is a series of books because the Ramayana takes up seven khandas. And there's one devotee who is from the Chaupati uh, temple his name is Subha Vilas, and he's done a series of books on the Ramayan, doing it one khanda at a time. He has finished five books that I know of. I think he may be even finished the sixth book, I'm not sure. But um, his Ramayan is interesting because it's a combination of two authorized versions of the Ramayan because Besides Valmiki's Ramayana, there's another Ramayana called Kambi's Ramayana, K-A-M-B-I, Kambi. Now you may, probably don't, haven't heard of Kambi. Well, Kambi was from the Sri Sampradaya. Kambi wrote the Ramayana. And then when he finished it, he presented it. The devotees in the Sri Sampradaya at that time 
said, who are you to remind, write the Ramayana? Wow, is, this is not authorized. Kumbi said, no, it is perfect. It is authorized. It is the Ramayana. They said, well, well you're going to have to prove it. Well, how should I prove it? They said, we will go before the Lord and we will sit there and we will read your Ramayana and the Lord will have to give indication that this is authorized. So in the Sri Sampradaya, in the Tirupati, not Tirupati, but Sri Rangam Temple, it was in Sri Rangam, there is a deity of Nishringadev who is Yoga Nishringa. He sits in meditation. So all the, uh, the leaders of the Sri Sampradaya sat there and Kambi, Kambi for days read his Ramayana and everybody listened. At the end, Lord Nishringadev did something. He took his arm and brought it out of his position of yoga, yoga position and held it straight up in the air to indicate, yes, this is the Ramayana. So this Kumbi Marayan, uh, uh, Ramayan is also an authorized version. Of course, we, we usually take the Valmiki Ramayan. And this devotee, Subha Vilas, has taken Kumbis and, and Valmikis and combined it into one. And he's presented an interesting version of the Ramayan, which is full of many, many interesting messages keeping very strict to the text itself, but presenting it in a very story-like form. So I, I highly re recommend that. Every time I get one of those books, I sit there and then I push everything aside and then I'll just finish it. <laughs> if I, sometimes I finish it in one day or two days. It's so absorbing and full of many, many interesting and spiritually powerful statements. Um, okay, so there's a lot we can say on the Ramayana. It's it's amazing. Uh, the Lord, when he appeared, he appeared in the Treta Yuga more than two million years ago to perform these activities. And uh, so, um, Therefore, yeah, we should be eager to hear the Ramayan regularly. In fact, there's places all around the world where the Ramayan gets read continuously, regularly. It's such an amazing scripture. And Ram teaches from the position as the Supreme Personality of Godhead, spirituality, morality, civility, saintly rule, ideal character, ideal husband, ideal friend, and, uh, you know, ideal chastiser of, the, of evil. So Ram's qualities are so amazing, so attractive, and so unlimited. Okay, so thank you for the opportunity. So we'll stop there and see if there's any comments or questions. Thank you so much, Mamaraj. Um, a, a lot of points, but I want to give the other devotees a chance to ask questions. Uh, please do either uh, mute. Un, I'm sorry, unmute yourself and ask your question, or uh, if you can raise the blue hand and and ask your question. Thank you. Hare Krishna, Maharaj. This is prediction that please accept our humble obeisances. All glories to all glories to you, glories to the power part. It's very nice, wonderful lecture. So many, I mean, I was trying to keep up making notes as <laughs> we were talking about it. But you've also summed it up to read one kanda at a time that Subhag Pilas Das is writing and sending out. So I'm definitely gonna go after that, find out where it is and start reading from the first kanda on on. on. Um one point that you brought up uh, that MD was actually the most severe of the six uh, enemies. Mm -hmm. And um, you said that if somebody is associating with someone 
who's envious is like associated with a snake. Now, sometimes devotees are envious too. And I've been through that experience of somebody who was envious. Um, and it was very, very traumatizing for me. Uh, um, <laughs> I won't go into detail about it. I'm almost itching to tell you what the situation was because it was a Gita Nagri. But because you know, a lot of people are listening, so I won't bring it up. Um, well, so what, what yeah, we, find, we find that devotees in general are, may exhibit certain qualities of envies that, in different situations, but on the whole, mm -hmm. they don't have that character of envy. Okay. That's just when something really hits an attachment, it may manifest in that way. But there are people who live in that mood of enviousness. That's pretty much, and of course, that's the non devotees. Mm. Devotees can sometimes become envious or exhibit envy like that. So that should be corrected. Because it should, you know, it can be very harmful. Mm. It has to be corrected. <laughs> can I ask a follow-up question, Maharaj? How how yeah. do you how do you correct it when that envy is from somebody who's senior to you as a devotee? Mm. And you find someone who is on that same level to do the work. Okay. Yeah, that's the best way. Someone who is who is that person's peer. Okay. Or superior. Thank you very much. Thank you. Maharaj, Sri uh, uh, Devi has a question. Go, go ahead, Mother Sri Devi. Thank you, Anasuya. Guru Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. All glories to Guru Dev. All glories to Sri Ram. Such a beautiful, beautiful class. Every word was just nectar. Thank you so much for relating this. My question is about the Lord Ram is idealized, of course, as the ideal king, taking care of his citizens like his own children. And so that pastime where that washerman commented, you know, I'm not like Lord Ram, that I will take back my wife after she has gone into the home of another man. And then Lord Ram thought deeply about it and he banished Sita. But my question is, Sita is also a citizen of the nation. Sita is also his dependent. So how he treated her like that, uh, exiled her and gave up her association and she had to go and live in a hermitage and give birth to children in a sage's ashram. I mean, if you think about it, what about poor mother Sita? Yeah, that question I've been hit with many times <laughs> and um, I finally after being hit with it enough time I finally decided to do some research to find out the real reason why it happened and there's a hidden reason that's not so prominent and uh, it's a long story I have it it's a nine page story that I have on my computer that describes two particular demons who started performing austerities and got the benediction that, let me see if I can remember. Hmm, it's really hard for me to remember the details of this story because it's very intricate. But they wanted to say they wanted to make that people could become liberated without following the principles of religion and therefore because they had performed austerities they got the benefit and they there was one clause that only only the only way that their benediction would not go through if Sita and Ram were separated. So, and so that was the indication that, okay, that was the clause that only if Sita and Ram were never separated, then this benediction would work. So they were giving people who are not qualified liberation 
and people were returning to, you know, the spiritual world who were just unqualified. So in order to destroy these two demons who had created that, Ram did that. He separated himself from his internal energy. That's the conclusion. So you have to read the whole story, which is nine pages. If you want it, I can send it. If you're ready to dive deeply into the details of this pastime to frustrate these two demons. And and they they would they would not they would live forever and also as long as Sita and Ram were never separated. And therefore they understood that Sita and Ram can never be separated. So it'll never happen. Therefore our plan will work. But Ram knew that. So he destroyed the demons and their plan by banishing Sita to the forest. Right. So that's, a, so that's, that's a, the hidden reason because whatever God does is always good. So I'm trying to understand the whole pastime. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah. but Mother Sita's situation is very pitiable from a queen, she is now a abandoned, destitute woman living in the forest. So, <laughs> you feel the same way? Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, um, we, won't, we, won't, we won't take that any farther. <laughs> but anyway, the point is that um, it was time for the Lord to wrap up his pastimes. So she stayed at Valmiki's ashram, gave birth. She was pregnant when she was banished to two sons who later came back to the kingdom. And then she left the world at Valmiki's ashram. So this was also part of the disappearance, uh, Leela to separate themselves and then gradually they would both disappear. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Marsh, that's a question. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Marsh, go ahead. Uh, go ahead. No. Marsh, that's a question here um, from a devotee um, says, doesn't God chastise the good devotees too? Yeah, yeah, he does, but his chastising is always for their benefit. For the demons, he ch it's also for their benefit too. But the, the Lord doesn't kill the devotees. He chastises them, corrects them, and gradually shows them what's wrong and how to correct. But for the demons, he kills them because that's the only solution to their problem. So both are equal because the Lord Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, Samoham Sabahuteshu Namei Dwesis Trinatriya. I'm equal to everyone, I envy no one, nor am I partial to anyone. But then again, at the end of that verse, he says, But one who renders devotional service is a friend, and I am a friend in him. So the Lord treats everyone equally according to. That verse in the Bhagavad Gita in the fourth chapter, Yayatam Mantra Patyante Tams Tataiva Bajamiaham, Mama Vartmanu Vartante Manusha Partasarvasyaha. As they approach me, I reward them accordingly. Everyone follows my path in all respects. So the Lord is giving everyone their due, uh, you know, whatever they're, they're due to get. And he's good. He's all good, supreme personality of God. Yes, he does chastise the devotees, but it's for their benefit. Thank you, Maharaj. But, I'm sorry. That's, just, that's like a loving father chastising the children. Are there any other questions or comments? Um, please uh, do ask 
you can unmute yourself and ask your question. Marge, I have a question actually in, in the earlier part of the lecture, you and I'm uh, please correct me if I'm wrong because I, I was trying to take notes as you were speaking. You were saying that um, Ram is considered the highest incarnation from one, you know, from one of the Narayans. If I'm if I heard you correctly, Marge. Yeah. Marge, why not Krishna? Why Ram? I'm just trying to. No, Understand. yeah, yeah, from the Vaikuntha realm. Krishna is not in the Vaikuntha realm. He's in Golokadam. He is the supreme personality of Godhead from where all manifestations come. Krishna is the source of Ram also. There's nothing superior than Krishna. But when you, in the Vaikuntha realm, these are Narayan manifestations, the Vishnu manifestations. The highest one in that, in that realm is Lord Ram. But Krishna is, he is Adi Purusham, Govindam Adi Purusham, Tamaham Bajrami. Thank you, Marge. Are there any other comments or questions? Uh, trying to go down the list here. Okay, I was. Uh, just want to just check with Sri Devi if she has any questions because I know that she always has very nice questions to ask. This one, one from Brett Huffman. <laughs> okay, Brett, uh, perfect. Oh, great. Yes, Hare go Krishna. ahead, Brett. Hare Krishna Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. Maharaj, we spoke a lot about envy. Um, and I think in a way how envy is the lowest of bad qualities, I think, for a lot of non-devotees and people out in society today. Envy can be something that could lead to one taking their own life. Um, I work in the telecommunications <laughs> industry and did a lot with media studies. Yeah, we're also college, uh, and throughout the 20s, we saw a large spike in suicide rates in younger people. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Yeah, something you're, you were something and then, is and, in terms of that. Uh, what I'm you're, getting, you're, Mahaj, is we you're breaking up, so some of the words are being missed. I think, Marge, I, I'll try to catch what he said. I he, he said that he works. Uh, okay, he said he's he's gonna type, um, but I think what he was trying to say, and Brad, you can still go ahead and type your, your question, that he works in the telecommunications uh, uh, um, job, and he says that there is a high rate of suicide, I believe he said, um, among the younger generation due to envy. Is that right, Brad? Yes, Mataji. Okay. I don't know if you can hear me now, but Mahaj, yes. the, the, my question is, so technology is rampant. We see how youth today are on social media. They're focusing on envy, comparing themselves to others. It leads to suicide. How can uh, us as Vaishnavas, we can't stop technology, but how can we help, you know, cultivate the youth of tomorrow, raise a community back to association? Maybe something like education on technology will be something in the future Vaishnavas will discuss more. How to use technology to benefit people? No, how to how to more so mitigate it and come back to association. I mean, even today, Maharaj, we oh. speak a lot about how we see devotees on their phones with their hands in their bead bag. Devotees are very much so on these smart devices and mm -hmm. could it potentially lead a devotee to envy just by comparing themselves, just constantly seeing things. Can we educate our children how to use these things appropriately, et cetera? Yeah. Yeah, these, uh, these electronic devices have somewhat depersonalized our relationships. Um, and therefore, a lot of things are, are, are assumed because of the lack of uh, personal contact. And that's why there's a lot of uh, apparats that come through the uh, media because the association is not there. People conclude and write and send um how can we come back to a more well that's a good question uh, we're right now in a tailspin where 
the media now has become more of a use for people in general because of the lack of uh, personal, the, the, the ability to not be able to associate individually as we used to prior to this, this pandemic. Um, it's actually, a, it's a neurosis, uh, this uh, asphyxiation on electronics, especially the cell phones. Uh, when I was in a college in, uh, a couple of years ago, I was in Boston. I was in, I gave a lecture at Northeastern College in Boston. And it was a very educated group of people, very uh, well-mannered, very intellectual. Um, we spoke on, uh, what did I speak? Yeah, we spoke on the use of technology. And uh, I was with one devotee of mine. And uh, at the end, of course, we started to show the downside of cell phones. And in my particular lecture, I um, gave some of the reasons or some of the reasons why these things are not healthy and they're not really socially beneficial. Uh, one young man, he came up to me, he was practically in tears. I couldn't believe it. He was, he was quite distraught. And he was saying, if I don't have my, if I don't see my cell phone for six minutes, I go crazy. And he wasn't just, just you know, saying that, he was actually feeling that. Um, it's a neurosis that so much has traveled around the world. In fact, in certain places, I've seen signs, especially in India, where people have certain physical uh, anomalies or deformities because of overuse of cell phones, uh, mostly. It's the cell phones that people are really addicted to. So how to do that? Well, Krishna consciousness means sadhu sangha more association with each other. Technology can be used to preach and to communicate, but if it becomes a fetish or attraction beyond the necessity, then uh, we, have a, we, have what, we have the problem we have today. Depersonalization, alienation, envy, suicide and a host of many other problems that have come due to this um, lack of uh, developing relationships with others. And that's all part of the progress of materialistic society as it goes more and more in the area of technology and in the area of convenience. If you take things back at least 150 years, you'll find Life was much more simple and people were much more together. Um, they had their problems too, but not like these kind of problems that we have today, in the sense that uh, there was very little, uh, what we say, uh, uh, mental health problems. The mental health problem in the world is one is actually the highest form of sickness right now. The World Health Organization out of Washington D.C. has given statistics that more than one third of the world's population, much more, is uh, suffering from one form of diagnosed mental illness, and that doesn't include people who are not accountable in the statistics, which is just uh, also a very huge number also. So yeah, we are in a society that is somewhat dysfunctional socially and uh, yeah, very socially dysfunctional society. We can't relate to each other. <laughs> we relate simply on the basis of uh, what I can gain from that relationship. So families have fallen apart, the relationships have fallen apart all because of this um, misuse of technology.
Thank you, Maharaj. Brett, I hope Maharaj answered All your right. question. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Maharaj. Hare Krishna, all glories to you. I don't have a solution. All I know is devotees should, Sadhu Sangha is the solution. Devotees should come together more and have cure. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, yes, that's a good. Brett, you asked a very nice question. Yeah. And uh, just use your cell phone for what's necessary. I just have it on my desk. I hardly even look at it. People send me text messages and I respond every once in a while. And that's it. I hardly get a phone call. Mars, that's a nice question. Also, a follow up on Brett's question from uh, from uh, <clears throat> Dear Krishna. He said, um, Brett Prabhu has raised a very important concern, especially for youth. Can we organize few seminars on this topic delivered, um, conducted, I'm assuming he's meant, by, by some young devotees? Well, let me see if they can find, I, I actually did a seminar in Boston, some, a series of lectures on this. Um, and that was, I think, let's see, 2018, it was, yeah. In the uh, fall of 2000, no, maybe it was a little earlier. Yeah, it was around, what time of the year was that? Mm. Yeah, it was around September 2018. And those lectures are recorded. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a good seminar. There's many points, but it's related to, to the mind, how the mind works in relationship to the external environment. Thank you, Marge. Um, there is a, a Madhavi Prabhu, I think, wants to ask a question. You can go ahead, Madhavi. Uh, Hare Krishna. I, I'm a Madhavi's husband. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> uh, this is uh, regarding the question was um, why the Lord or Guru chastise good people or good devotees. So I like to share my understanding. My understanding is when Lord or uh, Guru chastise good people or good devotees because they want uh, people to go higher in advancement, spiritual advancement for a more purification. And uh, there is no limit of purification. There is no limit of uh, advancement. That's my understanding is. Yeah, that's true. Mm -hmm. Some chastisement, some purification leads to uh, spiritual advancement. That's the that's the goal. That's the purpose. That's the case in many situations. Not all situations, but in in some. Whatever the Lord does is beneficial. You read that throughout the Bhagavatam. How he took everything away from. Bali Maharaj's Lord Vamanadev. And after Bali gave everything to the Lord, the Lord punished him. He said, now you are a, a thief. You have promised me three steps. You only gave, you only gave me two. So now you, you should be punished for not keeping your word. So the Lord was pretty heavy with Bali. Really heavy. <laughs> but Bali was willing to accept whatever the Lord was doing because he had complete faith in the Lord. It was for his benefit. And ultimately the Lord showed that at the end that he glorified Bali by giving him a place in the lower planets where it was as opulent as the king of heaven. And the Lord came there personally to assist Bali by doing personal service. So, yeah, sometimes the Lord will become really hard to accept, but it's all for the benefit of the, of the devotee. Thank you, Maharaj. It's a very, good, very, very good example. And all obeisances to you and Srila Prabhupada. Thank you. Hare Krishna. 
Maraj, when, when you were mentioning about uh, the Ramayan book, my I, I kind of had a difficulty with my connection. I wanted to ask you about the book written by Krishna Dharma Das Prabhu. Is, is that a, a, a really good version? I don't know. If... Yeah, I read that at least three or four times. Okay. It's, it's, it's a one volume version. You can, yeah, you can probably find it on, on Amazon really easily. Thank you, Mars. Just wanted to um, check on, on that book. Are there any other questions or comments? Uh, please. Yes, Prichit Prabhu has a question. Prichit, go ahead. Hi, Krishna Maharaj. Speaking about the um, book, the one that you talked about, the body that uh, has been writing one kanda at a time, um, yeah. where could you find that? Is it also on Amazon? Um, you can you can check different book outlets. His name is Suba Vilas, S U B H A V I L A S. Go. Well, you can also probably Google his name. Yeah. He's he's also does uh, work with different corporations. He gives lectures to all kinds of audiences. Okay. His books are interesting because he he footnotes the entire book with different messages as they come up in the in the past times. Yeah. Thank you, um, Thank you. Uh, Sri Devi and uh, Radha Vinodhani. They, they shared two links for the books on the chat. So thank you so much. They are fast. <laughs> Faster the fingers than me. Uh, Mars, there's one question from Vishaka. She said, uh, my question is not exactly related to the topic we discussed today. Do Vanashram Dharma and Sanatan Dharma have the same purpose? If so, is it correct to think of Sanatan Dharma as higher than Vanashram Dharma? Or is Sanatan Dharma more the fuel or purpose behind Vanashram Dharma? Um. Yeah, yeah, Sanatan Dharma is the fuel and purpose behind Vanashram Dharma. Vanashram Dharma is the organization of the spiritual and social uh, activities of society. Uh, Sanatan Dharma is the goal, actually. But Sanatan Dharma is our, is our therefore, we connect Sanatan Dharma. And, to the principle of activities within the within the uh, Varnashram Dharma, especially in the Varnas. So Prabhupada wanted to establish that before he left. He wanted to establish what is called Daivi Varnashram, which means Varnashram, which is fueled by Sanatan Dharma, which is the same thing. That what means that Everyone works according to their particular natural tendencies and engages in devotional service. It's not, uh, it's not uh, material vanasha where you just organize according to you, one swadharma or material propensities, but it's daivi, daivi vanasha, spiritual varna and ashram. So, yeah. The goal is Krishna consciousness. The organization is Varna and Ashram. Thank you, Maharaj. Uh, Sri Devi also posted a link about the book by Subha Vilas Das on the G chat. That's also available in Ramayana. I'm just sharing with the devotees who are interested to get that book. Okay. Uh, about five, that. There's five books. Five books are in print and available. I think he's probably finished with the sixth book, but I haven't seen it yet, so I'm not sure. Um, he, can do he, he does know? other books too. He's done a few other interesting books. Are there any other questions or comments? Um, please do ask. Um, and like we, yes, go ahead. Can uh, Sri Devi, what you've been, um, all of these references or, or links that we're getting, can that be put on the WhatsApp also? No, this is not for my eyes, but WhatsApp for us. 
it's gone WhatsApp. Harry's work. Anyway, I'll talk to you about it. Shri Devi has a question. Go ahead, Shri Devi. Uh, Parikshit Prabhu, you can always text me and I can send it to you on WhatsApp. Okay, thank you. Thank okay. you. That works. Thank you. Um, uh, my question is about association. Guru Maharaj, you said that, you know, Mantara, at first, Kaikeyi, who loved Ram like her own son, was not in the least interested, but uh, uh, Mantara, by preying on her mind, completely twisted everything. So what is the Leela behind this? Because we know that everything is done by the will of the Lord. So what was the Lord's intention in allowing this to happen? <laughs> so he could be banished to the forest and kill Ravana. Ah, okay. The demigods, the demigods arrange for the Lord and the monkey soldiers to come to rid the world. Yadayadayi dharmasya glanir bhavati bharata. Bhutanam dharmasya tadatmanam. Pravitranayam sarunam vinasana siddhuskritam. Dharma samstarpanartaya sambhavami yuge yuge. The, de the demigods wanted to uh, destroy Ravana. He was so powerful. So the Lord descended to fulfill the, de the desire of the, de demi the demigods. That's mentioned also. So every incident, everything that is happening is there to teach us some lesson. Why Mantara did the, what she did? Why Bharat, you know, himself took on the austerity of going into uh, Nand, Nand, what is that? Nanda, Nandagram, some place where he lived like an ascetic. So yeah. all for us. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, the Ramayana is full of messages. There's hundreds and hundreds and th thousands of messages in that particular treatise, more than any other. Uh, exposition on spiritual life can you find so much through Leela in that Leela there is so much uh, it's just one thing after another thank you Guru Maharaj yeah. Maharaj there's a question on Facebook that I just missed and I was just alerted on that and because we have this lecture also um uh, live on Facebook through our, our temple page. And the question here, Marge, is um, from, Mal, uh, from Mathura uh, uh, in Lewistown. And she said, I joined late, so I apologize, Marge, if this question was already addressed. In this modern day, many say that Mother Sita was not treated fairly when she was banished by Lord Ram when she was pregnant. How do you explain that to people when preaching? <laughs> <laughs> I've been trying to explain it for the last 20 years. <laughs> Hare Krishna. Some things are just hard to explain because the women class can never accept it. You know, I've been even blasted by some ladies, you know. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, but the underlining theme is what I mentioned to, de to destroy these two demons who had uh, changed the whole way that fruit of activities work. They were so powerful to their austerities. That's the underlining theme. But the other, the other, the other reason is that gradually to, uh, you know, to keep his reputation there's another reason, which is a smaller reason, uh, that when that washerman, not washerman, but just a person in general, criticized the Lord, that was another reason. The other reason was gradually to wind up their pastimes in this world. So you'll see, you'll see it in Ram Leela, you'll see it in Krishna Leela. Yeah, especially in Krishna Leela, you'll see it in Gaur Leela. The Lord breaks the hearts of his devotees, but in order to fulfill his mission a lot of times. But breaking the hearts of his devotees only is that he causes separation. And in that separation, the uh, and love intensifies even more. 
Krishna Lila, the gopis were, and all the residents of Vrindavan were on the verge of death, but Krishna stayed away because he had a whole host of demons he had to finish off before he came back. He had Shishupal, he had Pandraka, he had Dantravarka, he had, uh, who was else? Uh, who was that one powerful? Uh, of course, Kamsa was the first one. And then... Uh, Jarasan? Sandra, yeah, Jarasan is the other one. So Jarasandha wasn't so easy to kill. He arranged so many things. So he had to clean up all these demons because the demons were not only there, but they were harassing people all over, including the devotees. So that to protect the devotees, he had to stay out of Vrindavan to finish out all these demons. Lord Chaitanya took sannyas, broke, broke the heart of his many devotees like that in order to, to show the example of how to preach in the sannyas order of life. And of course, there's other reasons also. So yeah, we see in all of the leelas, those that were intimately connected with the Lord and many times are feeling uh, broken heart of due to separation from the Lord. But that simply enhances the whole mood of separation, which is a higher intensification of loving relationships. The intensity of separation is even stronger than the, the principle of meeting. Because in that, in that mood of separation, Longing to be with the Lord, to serve the Lord, to show the love for the Lord, brings that person's heart directly connected with the Lord through that longing. And that's intense. And Krishna Lila, I mean, Krishna really, really made it difficult for the residents of Vrindavan. But at the end, he came back and satisfied everybody after he finished all the demons. He came back, and it was a big celebration, and he stayed in Vrindavan. Ultimately, he took the entire, the entire population of Vrindavan back to the spiritual world. That's how it ends. Thank you, Maharaj. Um, a question. Mansi, do you want to go ahead? And then I will have uh, Madhavi uh, ask her next question. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Please um, accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. All glories to yourself. Um, Maharaj, my question is, again, going back to the same topic of envy. Um, I, <clears throat> I'm unclear when you say that a devotee, they don't have the envy so you know the part that you mentioned um i didn't clearly understand that they show envy but actually it is not there that's what i understand from what you explained but i'm still not clear about it and the other thing other question related to that is that sometimes you are in a relationship with somebody and um, in the initial part of the relationships you don't realize the nature of many devotees and then gradually you realize, and in this particular case, like if there is, if you see the envy bit later on in the relationship, even though they are devotee and you wish to pull back in the friendship, is that okay? Is that... Because I see that rubbing on your personality, rubbing on your character, because association will bring the effect. Well, you have to protect yourself from negative qualities. So you have to choose your association. Uh, if you feel yourself being uh, drug, brought down by that, that either you have to correct the situation or you have to leave the situation, either one. You have a choice. So, uh, yeah. But then again, the relationship is there. So you have to learn how to do that, depending on the intimacy of the relationship. 
then you can work accordingly. You can try to really change the situation through circumstances. Or if you're very personally related to the person, then you can approach that person and discuss these things. In a humble way. Okay. You have, and, to see, you have to see what is the dynamics of the situation. But the idea is not to let yourself get dragged down by someone else's negativity. And even says that in our Shastras, if someone is a devotee, but they don't, they're not exhibiting good qualities, we can respect them from a distance, but we should not associate with Okay. Okay, thank you. And the other part, the first part that um, if you can um, explain me again, that I didn't understand uh, the bit that you mentioned that the non devotees, they carry the enviousness and the devotees, they only um, exhibit it, but they actually don't have that in their personality. So if you can please um, uh, tell me something a little bit more about it. Well, it seems to be clear. The whole world is envious. Everybody's envious of everybody else. Mm -hmm. the, the, the envy is everywhere. Mm -hmm. That's what makes the world go on. Prabhupada also says, you come to the material world because you're envious of Krishna. And then when you're here, you're, you take up envious of each other. That's material. So that envious may take different levels, and then there's jealousy. Jealousy is different. Jealousy is when you feel bad about yourself because of somebody else. And envious is when you feel bad towards another person. Thank you. Okay. So jealousy is like if somebody is um, having something which we don't have, then we feel that, oh, why we don't have it? And envy is when somebody has something and we don't have it, we feel, oh, why that person has it. Yeah, that's pretty clear. Yeah. Mm, okay. Yeah, that's good. Okay. And je jealousy, you're turning it towards yourself. Envy, you're turning it outside towards the other person. Mm. Okay. Thank you so much, Maharaj. Thank you. Okay, mm -hmm. that clarifies. Thank you. Mars, I, can give you, I can give you a nice, nice uh, statement about envy, which will hmm. destroy any possibility of becoming envious. Do you want to hear it? Yes, <laughs> yes. definitely, definitely. <laughs> okay, this is so this, I'll, I'll give the author of this so I don't take, I'm not taking credit for this. This is spoken by His Holiness Radhanath Swami Maharaj. And he, meant, he said that when you, are feel, when you are envious of others, you don't realize that what other, whatever another person is, is being sanctioned by God himself. So therefore, God has allowed this person to be something they are or have something. Therefore, your negativity towards others is not really towards the other, but is towards Krishna, because you don't like what Krishna did to allow that person to have something or be something. Haribol. Actually, wow. envy, envious of Krishna. Mm -hmm. mm. Such a deep connection. Wow. Yeah. You really, nothing can happen without the will of the Lord. So Krishna is allowing whatever is going on to go on. Therefore, if there's envy, you know, it's it's it's. Um, it's in one sense part of Krishna's external energy. Yeah. It's not. It's not good. It's not. Doesn't mean it's good. You know. When you understand nothing, Krishna is the source of everything. He doesn't make envy happen, but he allows envy to go on because that's what people want. Yeah, this is very profound, Maharaj. Thank you so much.
And if you think about that, you'll never be envious to anybody. Yeah. Because <laughs> you'll think, you think, oh, why should I feel like that? Krishna is allowing that person to be who they are or what they are, have what they are. Yes. Very nice question once. It's really deep. <laughs> Yeah, Maharaj, you have just um, cut the knot of the of the uncle unclarity that I had, and you gave me much more deeper um, thing to meditate and to be mindful and careful about. Because a lot of times um, the habit is just to look on the outside and not inside. But yeah you gave such a nice thing to meditate for a lifetime, basically. Mm -hmm. And envy yeah. is, and envy is counteracted by two things. One is humble service to the Vaishnavas and learning to be satisfied with whatever Krishna give, give you and knowing that's perfect. Mm hmm. hmm. Yeah, we, we're Krishna is giving everything, giving something to everyone. So just be happy and satisfied, whatever you, whatever He's given you, or whatever you are. And from there, you can work to increase it and to build on it. But there's always a sense of satisfaction that Krishna loves me, and that's all I care. <laughs> So one thing is coming to my mind, Maharaj, when you when you shared this about envy, that um, I had heard from many senior devotees that um, in Bhagavatam, when we used to study Bhagavatam with Kartik Chandra Prabhu every fortnight, Kartik Chandra Prabhu has also told us many times that if you only if you only uh, we should read Bhagavatam every day, but you know, even if someone thinks that they are not scholarly and if they just want to keep reading the same verse again and again and again, and if they just meditate on one, one single verse and they just try to find deeper and deeper and deeper meaning, you know, your spiritual life is successful. You will just learn everything from that one verse. And I feel the same thing from what you have shared right now that just one Thing, this one simple thing, which seems to be simple, but very hard to work on, that if we ever get envious of somebody, it is an indirect enviousness for Krishna because Krishna has given that person. So if I just determine myself to just achieve this one thing, that if I can go deeper into this and try to implement it, you know, uh, I don't need to do anything else. I'll just learn everything from this one one statement. Well, that's true. Then you'll you'll see that you'll see the results mm. because there's so there's so much more than just the words of the statement. It's a whole unraveling of the the way the way we think. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, it's all clear, Maharaj. Thank you. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you so much, Maharaj. Just want to, I think um, Madhavi has a question or a comment. Uh, yeah, it's uh, Satyanayana again. This time it's a question. Uh, Hare Krishna, Maharaj, Obinson's is to your lotus feet again. Um, my question is uh, in the Treta Yuga, uh, Dasarath Maharaj had uh, more than one wife and his ideal son uh, believed in having only one wife. So was it a different tradition and uh, Lord Ram reestablished the tradition? So i like to know about it. What's the question? The yeah, question was Dasarath Maharaj had more than one wife mm -hmm. and Lord Ram believed in uh, being an ideal husband having only one wife. Yeah. So was it a, he he reestablished the tradition or what? No, he kept Ekapati, that was his vow. Oh, okay. Yeah, when Vegavati approached him, he said, I can't 
uh, I can't accept you because in this particular incarnation, I'm only accepting one wife. Hmm. That was a vow he took, that's all. But it, was, it wasn't, he didn't break tradition, he just no. did that. Yeah, that's, that's what I wanted to clear, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Marsh, that's a question. Uh, Radha Vinodani, you can unmute yourself and ask your question. Hare Krishna, thank you very much. Uh, Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj and uh, dear devotees, please accept my humble obeisances, our glories to Srila Prabhupada. Uh, my question actually would be a follow-up question to the ones um, connected to um, association uh, because uh, Guru Maharaj, you mentioned that uh, when uh, association drags us uh, down, uh, we should uh, take the necessary steps. And my difficulty is that uh, sometimes I'm, uh, I'm uh, engaged uh, in the association before I realize that it's, it's bad. For example, Prajapa is typically like that, that it has this uh, kind of taste uh, that uh, we uh, start to uh, do it. And, uh, and after uh, doing it for a long time, we just uh, realize that uh, we are doing something wrong. How is it possible? What was, it, what was that thing you mentioned? I missed the word. Uh, prajapa. Oh, Prajapa. Oh, okay. Uh, so it's, it's uh, so tempting that we don't even realize uh, soon enough that we are doing something bad. No, just be accustomed to, to hearing and chanting the glories of the Lord and then you'll have something spiritual in your mind and then in your heart. We have to talk, and therefore, generally when we talk, it's some form of prajapa. So uh, we have to take more time to hear and chant the glories of the Lord and develop a taste for that. What action says that, Prabhupada says, if you can't say anything beneficial then don't speak anything <laughs> remain <laughs> quiet <laughs> you know it's not it's a fact that the tongue is the most difficult to control you know the tongue gets you in trouble yeah. and it's due it's due to the what is called it's due to the um, what's, what's the word? I'm trying to think of the word. It's due to the um, disturbed mind. When the mind is peaceful and connected to Krishna, then there's no, no disturbances. And then whatever you say is fine. But when the mind is disturbed, it comes out in the form of speech in different ways. And it may look like it's something nice, but it's just the urge to speak. That's Vacho Vegam, Manasakota Vegam, Upasta Vegam. The first verse in Sri Upadeshamrita, that the, the urge to speak, the urge, the mind, the urge of tongue, belly, genitals, the six urges, they call Vegams, or urges. You have to, we have to control them by regulating them according to how they're supposed to be used. Like that. So, yeah, but the social environment sometimes exasperates our pajalpa. We see meet somebody and all of a sudden we just, we just rattle on, you know? <laughs> I remember I was on a plane one time. I couldn't believe it. I was sitting, and behind me, in the row, in the row across from me and behind me, one lady spoke the whole time, two hours at high volume, high volume. Everybody on the plane could hear her, but nobody did anything. They all tolerated it. And I, I had a set of earphones which are very highly you know, like uh, they, they keep out all noise. I put them on 
and still I could hear her. <laughs> it was just, <laughs> and then I remembered what Prabhupada said. <laughs> we have to learn to tolerate. I, I wasn't going to correct her because that wasn't my position. And I know that it would have turned into something ugly if I did. Um, so I just, we all had to tolerate it. But certain people around them, around her, thought it was nice. And she was speaking, and some people were listening, and but it was, it was just all nonsense. I didn't hear what she said, but I could. So yeah, so we have to tolerate this desire or urge to speak, and we have to tolerate others who are you know, falling into that category of prajapa, what can we do? Sometimes if you're with someone and you're, they're speaking something wrong or prajapa, you take something from what they say and turn it into something spiritual, something Krishna conscious or something pleasant. Yeah, it's, it's very nice. Uh, it's just, I, I found that uh, my mind can be such a great yeah. enemy in this case because uh, yeah. uh, many many cases these discussions uh, move away from the Lord uh, so gradually that it's difficult. For example, like we are speaking about pastimes, then we are speaking about services, then we are speaking about the persons uh, doing the service, and in the in the end we end up just fin uh, finishing uh, speaking about people and. Um, yeah, yes. that's, that's, that's the, the crazy mind. Yeah. But then, therefore, you have to, are you, follow, are you listening to my seminar at night? Uh, I plan to, but I, I uh, couldn't uh, uh, listen I gave, to it. I gave two classes the last two mm -hmm. nights. On, tonight is the third night, and tomorrow is the fourth night. Mm -hmm. It's on the mind. So uh, maybe you can get the recordings. Yeah, the yeah. Mind, the, the mind just uses the senses to. Uh, the senses pull the mind, or the mind engages the senses in something that is not Krishna conscious, or something that is sometimes just disturbing or offensive. Offensive. Mm -hmm. Thank you so, very much. And when we when we actually start chanting nicely the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra, we start to learn how to really control the mind nicely. And then we're not so much inclined to speak unless it's actually absolutely necessary. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's uh, it's very useful. I uh... I plan to <laughs> practice it. Yeah, Thank work you. on your japa. That'll that'll strengthen the urge to speak in the wrong way. Mm. Yeah, I I will do that. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Hare Mars, there's one more question from Sri Devi. Go ahead, Sri Devi. Uh, Guru Maharaj, this is not really a question as much as a request. Uh, would you please be so kind as to share that nine-page document explaining the Lord's pastime of banishment, Sita, or Sita? Mm, I'm not supposed. I don't know if I'm supposed to. Oh, <laughs> I oh. was given. I was given it in confidence. But let me see. I can do. I can excerpt some parts of it and send it. Yes, please. Whatever is uh, permitted, no problem. Yeah, I can take that the essence and send that the whole nine pages is really not necessary for you to read. Okay. It just leads up to these two demons getting this benediction. Okay, thank you. Okay. If there are, are there any last minute questions or uh, comments? Lost my train of thought here. Just don't want to miss anyone out. Okay. 
uh, thank you so much, Maraj. As usual, it's so nice to hear your classes. And it's so nice to see you <laughs> via Zoom. And we hope that we can see you next year in person when this whole thing is over, Maharaj. Thank you so much for giving us your darshan, your mercy, and your blessings. And we wish all the devotees a wonderful day. All glories to Shri Prabhupada, His Holiness Chandramani Swami Ki. Thank you so much, Maharaj. Thank you. You are a gem.